Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium of the Pacific's lecture series. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the Aquarium, and it's great to have all of you with us this evening. We wish you could be here in person, but that's not possible. We look forward to having that happen soon. I want to acknowledge our lecture sponsors, Gazette Newspapers and Courtyard Marriott. Without their support, we would not be able to have this wonderful lecture series. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Mike Bardick. He's going to share photos and discuss the ocean's diverse and unusual creatures. He's a professional diver and underwater photographer. He resides in Anilao, the Philippines. He conducts photo safaris, lectures, seminars, and he specializes in macroscopic photography of plankton and small benthic animals. His work has been widely published in places like Sport Diver, California Diver Magazine, and in many other places. He manages the Crystal Blue Resort in the Philippines, where he conducts photo workshops, leads dive trips, and if you're ever interested in learning more about the kinds of things that he does and becoming a better photographer and just enjoying that experience, I highly recommend it. We've had the honor here at the Aquarium of the Pacific of displaying some of his beautiful, beautiful photographs of unusual animals, and they always draw lots of O's, oohs, and ahs, and uh, we love his work. Please join me in giving a virtual welcome to Mike Bartek. Mike, it's all yours. Thank you, Jerry. It's always an honor to be here, and uh, you know, sadly, you can't be there in person at this time, like you, like you said, but I'm coming to you tonight from, from the Philippines, and I couldn't be happier to do that. You guys have uh, always been very gracious to have me there. And um, tonight I have a, a nice talk. It's a, a great story that encompasses, uh, you know, the way the, the ocean works a little bit. And um, it's accompanied by beautiful images. I'll, I'll just start now and, and start going through these things. You know, I've always been fascinated with sea monsters. You know, I, everybody laughs when I show this slide because they think, oh, sea monsters, you know. But contextually, you know, you think about these kinds of creatures uh, at the time that these were illustrated, you know, maybe two or 300 years ago, people had no idea about uh, the kind of subject matter that lived below the surface of the ocean. And, you know, at that time, some of these creatures could have been enormous. We really don't know what the time lifespan is on a lot of these subjects. So for me, you know, you look at that and you, and you try to piece it together with what the reality is. And, you know, I've seen some pretty interesting things out there. Haven't quite seen any sea monsters yet, but this topic still fascinates me. So, you know, as an underwater photographer, I try to capture the natural beauty of subjects, um, you know, to the best of my ability. Uh, marine creatures, a lot of them are very timid, but if you allow them to get comfortable with your presence, then they behave in a, a very natural, uh, normal way. And for me, I, I try to capture images of subjects at the peak of their action moments. And I believe that really, really tells the story the best about these, these animals. And um, so that's kind of what I, I show throughout this talk are, are subjects in their peak of the action moments. Even though I'm using still images rather than video to tell the, sh the, uh, the story, I think that um, they're pieced together in a, in, a, in a way that is easy to follow along tonight. And um, also, you know, please keep in mind that even though the, set, the images are shot in a split second, um, sometimes it takes hours, days, even months to uh, scout and find the subject matter and then finally get the image. So um, not only are we gonna talk about the, the animals, but I wanna talk a little bit about their superpowers because a lot of these subjects that we see out there, they spend a lot of their lifetime, um, you know, just fighting against the odds and uh, trying to survive. And a lot of these subjects, that are in our ocean have really um, evolved in specific ways to survive. And I find that to be very fascinating and I like to call them their superpowers. So we'll discuss those, some of the mutual relationships that are unusual. And in the end, I'm sure that everybody will agree that our oceans are full of magnificent beasts. So how this story kind of evolves is, you know, we start up on the shoreline where we have you know, an estuary, and we work our way down across the sandy flats, 
past the coral reefs and into the open ocean. And um, I'm going to try to tie those things together in a, in a story that kind of involves all of it at the same time. As we know, mangroves are extremely important to the ecosystem of the ocean. They feed the seagrass and muck areas. They, they um, provide shelter for small animal life and um, allow small subjects to, uh, to grow so they're stronger. And then they will eventually leave that area and then venture out into the pelagic areas and then develop and then resettle back onto the ocean, ocean floor. So uh, a lot of these subjects I've had the opportunity to see as um, larval and I've also had the opportunity to see them as adults or juvenile stage. So I'll try to pair as many of those together as I can throughout this talk. First, we'll talk about blennies and gobies, some of my favorite subjects. And you'll probably hear me say that a lot. This is my favorite subject. I, I just love all different kinds of subjects. So um, I tend to repeat myself in that area. But we'll start as we move down. Blennies and gobies are, are subjects that we'll see quite often in the shallows. Um, they're very cute, very timid. But uh, you have to remember that they're really masters of the domain. So a lot of these subjects that we see tonight, even though they have that cute factor to them, they're still truly masters of their domain. Okay, so this is a, a snake blending in the larval stage shot in the open ocean. This is the adult phase when it's actually on the sand. And um, even though the adult looks completely different than the larval stage, they behave almost exactly the same way. Here's another larval blending. So this, this one actually has wings. And this is the adult phase when it's living in the coral. So um, this is a Solarius blending. A lot of blennies hunt from a burrow. They create little holes. Uh, they have these huge inquisitive eyes, uh, very curious, and uh, which shows a degree of intelligence. And if you'll notice those little siri above the eyes, that, that allows them to kind of hide and uh, stay undetected. So a lot of animals have these kinds of traits. This is another one from California, again with the siri. And here this guy comes from... Um, the Sea of Cortez. So these blennies are a little bit different than the ones I just showed you. These ones live in a sandy burrow and they are, uh, this is what you call a, a nuptial or a defensive posturing. They, they tend to be um, very timid at first, but then again, if you take your time, they will pop out of the hole and then they begin to display. And when they're doing that, I usually like to look around to see who they're displaying to or why they're displaying. So. Uh, in other words, they could be trying to court a female or trying to, to ward off a male. Here's another one. I, I like to think of this guy as a hot rod just because of those beautiful colors. And so you'll, you'll sit down there on the sand with these guys for maybe 30, 40 minutes after you locate them. And um, it just looks like a stick. And then eventually that fin flares out and they begin to bob up and down. And um, to get the shot, you know, you really need a lot of patience. So here's one of the reasons why they might be showing that display. Um, you have two males, and uh, this one, two slides back, is showing his fin in a very defensive posture and um, trying to fight and protect his own territory against invading or encroaching males. So what happens is when they start to tussle or fight, the male will latch onto the gill plate of the other male and actually, um, you know, it's a fight to the death. So. This is a real peak of the action moment. This is a pike blenny, also found in the Sea of Cortez. And these guys are real snake-like. We also have them here in, um, or I'm sorry, they're off the uh, coast of Southern California, Channel Islands. You can see these guys, quite prevalent. And uh, they also like to bob and weave, but they really stand about a foot out of the sand when they do that. And um, very dramatic, they, get, they have this huge mouth. And if you get two males together, um, it's, it's quite uh, something to see. So um, very dramatic kind of thing. Fang tooth blennies we have here in the Philippines and in the Indo-Pacific, um, you can see why they call them fang tooths. You can see those fangs there. And uh, they are, are quite, um, quite a feisty little, little guy. Their mouth is really large. Now the, the fish is, is approximately this long, but you know, when they flare up their mouth like that, it's, it's incredible. And um, this kind of behavior you can see often when they're on eggs, as this guy is. So here's a detailed shot. So science actually proved that those fangs not only uh, protect the fish, but 
they also deliver a very toxic venom that will stun their their would-be prey. So uh, if, if they perceive something to be a, a predator to them, they have the ability to come out and bite that subject. And it doesn't kill the subject that it's biting, but it, it stuns them uh, and allows the, the fang blending to escape. Now, gobies are another subject. So uh, these guys, I really love. And, and you, you have to look at these, these panda gobies, and they are just the epitome of cute. But um, the coral gobies serve uh, a purpose that is greater good. So uh, what happens is these coral gobies, they, um, they have this fuzzy little beard, and they, they move around these small aquapora coral heads, and they almost polish and keep those polyps of the coral clean clean of any invasive algae. And in so doing that, of course, that help that coral stays healthy and provides a nice home for them. The pink eyed gobies, uh, they're hover gobies. So they're very much the same kind of uh, situation, but they will hover above the coral heads and then retract back into them if they feel threatened. But that beautiful pink eye, it really comes through when you're uh, shooting photos of these guys, and um, I just love to shoot photos of these guys. Now, whip coral gobies, they live on whip corals, obviously, and they, they share this habitat uh, with shrimp and crabs, and uh, they will spend their entire life cycle. Once they settle from plankton, they will settle onto these large whip corals, and they spend their entire life there. They have their babies, not their babies, but their eggs. The eggs will hatch, join the plankton, and the cycle continues. But uh, this one is just looking straight at me, coming down that beautiful piece of uh, whip coral in full current. Grass are, are a, a pretty interesting fish. Um, as we know, I believe they all start out as females and then slowly or individually can change their sex to male, uh, which is quite interesting. So the females can also change back to male in some cases, which I've read, um, but for, for um, for this quick topic, we're gonna to talk about flash arrest. So flash arrest, perhaps one of the most beautiful fish. If you're a fish lover, this guy is, is the one to see. So what we're looking at here is uh, a sub male in the middle with the females on the side. So in an area maybe the size of, uh, um, I don't know, 25 square feet, um, there might be five or six little pods of females living. And the sub-males will live with these little pods and try to, uh, try to mate with them. But what happens is that's not the one that the females are really interested in. The ones they want to, uh, to mate with to really, you know, prolong their, their bloodline is the super-males. So these are the sub-males. And this is the super-male. So the super-male is this vibrant fish that comes in twice the size of the other males. And when he comes in to mate, you know, it's, it's this thing where once you see it, you're just like hypnotized. So it's, it's very fast moving. He'll move in, mate with the fish, spawn, stop abruptly, move on to the next harem. And this continues for about a half an hour, uh, going from one to the next. And, um, you know, between 3.30 and 4, 4.15, uh, it's just crazy so after that it slows down again until the next day but this is the the, the super male of the flash arrest grass also play another important role of cleaning other fish so uh here we have um clean a grass cleaning a um, butterfly fish and i love that the way that the colors of these guys blend together so um you know a lot of fish out there there's a lot of parasites and things that can get onto them but they also provide a food source for other fish like the wrasse and so forth. So very interesting how that works. So, you know, we are talking about how uh, different subjects are able to um, survive. So even simple subjects that we would look at like a pipefish or a seahorse, they've adapted these exoskeletons that are quite strong. You know, it's, it's like putting on your steel armor uh, you know, and then going out into the world. So these guys have this, this really built-in uh, suit of, um, you know, that's just really strong and supports them. So uh, another thing that all the pipefish and seahorses have in common is, is the jaw. And if you notice that, it's a fused jaw. It's open, 
and they use that to vacuum little mice and shrimp from different things. This one's drifting in open ocean. This is a bend stick pipe fish. So this is a larval uh, type pipe fish that we'll see in open ocean that settles to the sand eventually and um, is quite different. The adult self is quite different than this really lovely larval, larval subject. Pot belly seawires, this guy is highly evolved. This one is from uh, South Australia. And talk about extreme morphology. Now, sometimes, you know, these, these subjects um, look almost exactly like the habitat that they're in. In fact, the closer that they match the habitat, the higher their chances of survival. But we'll see as we move along that um, other subjects use this in different ways, not just to match the habitat, but actually other creatures uh, to survive. So this is a pipefish living in Zini coral. This little guy is a pipe dragon. So he's not much to look at. Uh, he's very small, you know, maybe um, three quarters of an inch in length and probably as thin as a piece of dental floss. Uh, big bulbous head, giant eyes, and um, you know, they cling on to scruffy algae in uh, really kind of a dirty habitats. And they will move around and, and just vacuum up small mice and shrimp. A very interesting subject. You might be looking at something uh, else, you know, let's say you're looking at, I don't know, a nudibranch on the reef, and all of a sudden you'll see this piece of algae that is actually living. And uh, that's the kind of thing I, I find very intriguing. So uh, this pipe dragon, very an amazing, small, not the prettiest subject, but <laughs> Quite fascinating. Of course, what talk would be complete when you're not, when you uh, don't include the leafy sea dragons? So, uh, as you know, Jerry, I, I saw the leafies at the Aquarium of the Pacific for the first time in uh, I think 2009 or 2010, and it really pushed me to to go out into the world and and move around and try to see these things for myself. If you have never seen a leafy sea dragon, um, you have to go to the aquarium and see these guys, and believe me, it will just blow your mind. Here's how they look individually, uh, almost like a, a character, you know, out of a cartoon, but uh, it's crossed between a pipefish and a seahorse. They also have that, that jaw that's fused, and, you know, the different appendages on the body help it to just blend perfectly with its habitat, but they don't really serve any other purpose besides that. Um, as you can see, the swimmerettes on the back end of the spine there, that's how they actually ambulate and move around the water. Um, so, yeah, they just really match their habitat very well. The seagrass that this one is hunting in is just under it, and it was in a surging condition with the, with the water moving back and forth, the seagrass drawing, and then when, when the seagrass would flip over, the sea dragons would pop up, it could take photos, and then it would go back down into the seagrass. So um, I was fortunate to get the sun on this one. So on the sand itself, we have sea mantis. And uh, as, as you know, there's, um, you know, they, they're very interesting subjects. So there's, there's over 450 of these uh, guys described. They're known as violent predators and, and they are, they can be quite violent. Um, also known as thumb splitters. And, and there's folklore out there that they've cracked fish tanks. They've uh, broken photographers' dome ports and all kinds of things. I say folklore because I've never met the person that it's actually happened to, but they are quite capable of survival. So here we have two different individuals in the larval stage. Um, the one on the left will eventually settle to the sand. We believe that's a tiger tail, uh, common, common name, tiger tail. The one on the right is um, the balloon stage mantis. Now this, this one will never settle to the sand. So it just remains in the plankton, drifts around until it's consumed uh, either, you know, by a larger animal or, or something else of that nature. So out of the 450 different varieties that are described, there's only a, a small amount of those that actually settle to the sand. The rest of them become part of the greater food web. What makes these guys so interesting is uh, these offensive or defensive appendages. Um, you could basically split this whole family of subjects into spearers and smashers. So the spearing uh, subjects live in their burrows. They have this raptorial kind of claw that um, stabs out and will actually 
uh, impale their victims and pull them into the, into their burrow and then feed on them. Fish, uh, octopus, uh, anything that actually gets into its strike zone. The other one, uh, the other mantis that use the smashing appendages, they will roam. They will roam out. They'll leave their hole. They'll go out. They smash bivalves like, like clams and, um, and other things. I've even seen them just hitting rocks, smashing rocks. For what reasons, I'm not sure. Um, the... Uh, the surface of their of their hammer is is like Kevlar. It's very hard, and it's rumored that they can actually cavitate water or boil water on the leaden surface of that uh, hammer. It moves through the water so fast, the friction actually boils the water. Definitely worth a Google. So those that spear hunt from the holes, and those that smash roam around. So. Pink-eared mantis on the left with the white eggs, beautiful subject. The one on the on the right side is a peacock mantis, of course, again with those uh, beautiful red eggs. And one other, one last thing I'd like to point out about these guys is their ability, their vision. It's uh, it's quite amazing what they can see. In fact, they have the most photo sites of any subject yet to be discovered on the planet. I think centipedes are right behind them. But um, these guys are really capable of, of extreme vision, and they're able to maintain the same uh, light throughout the day. So what I mean is if it's bright, sunny day or very dark at night, they can still see uh, an adequate amount of light to hunt and do what they need to do. So very fascinating subject. You can see the detail of the eye. Great subject. Frogfish, another one of my favorites. They're a globulous subject, and uh, they are really masters of camouflage. And what they like to do is, is just sit. They rely on their camouflage. They use uh, a fishing lure to fish for other fish, and they wait for subjects to get into their strike zone by using uh, different methods of hunting without expending their own energy. So they live on the substrate, uh, fastest strike speed of all the fish. They have a huge bucket mouth. They're stoic ambush predators. And again, they fish for other fish. Here's a little guy mimicking a sponge. Here's an another one mimicking a stone. You can really see that big lure out there that they use to stimulate other fish into coming close for dinner. Uh, hairy frogfish, some of my absolute favorites. Orange ones mimic algae on the substrate. Black ones mimic the black urchin spines, uh, spiny urchins, sorry. And then the white ones mimic uh, the spent urchins or broken shells. So a lot of times on habitat, we'll, we'll see areas where there might be a lot of octopus that feed, smashing shells or rays that, um, you know, they'll burrow and then pull shells out of the, out of the sand to feed. And see, you'll see a lot of these broken shells. Those white hairy frogfish will be in that same habitat. This is a sargassum frogfish. Again, very um, evolved. And this, this guy spends most of its life drifting in open ocean. So after it, it hatches, it spends a period of its life developing in open ocean, settles to sargassum on the substrate, and then leaves that and... and wanders around the ocean again. So they've developed these huge paddle-like uh, hands and, and they move quite well. They're really, really strong swimmers and fast in the open ocean, <laughs> unbelievably. This guy is a psychedelic frogfish. And this one is uh, shot in Ambon in Indonesia and uh, is supposed to be a deep water frogfish that comes up to, to mate and spawn. They actually carry their eggs, it's one of the few uh, frogfish that actually care or brood their, their eggs. Most of them are cast spawners, so they'll, they'll spawn and then their eggs will just drift out, out into the uh, current line. But this guy actually carries them. Very detailed, look at that coloration. It really perfectly matches uh, sponges. Good example of that big bucket mouth. So imagine, you know, this, this mouth opens very quickly and it, as it does, it, it drops open and it just pulls in a volume of water. So if you're a fish and you're in that strike zone, perhaps looking at that lure, uh, you know, that mouth opens and it just sucks you right in. I've seen it happen many times. 
and these guys are just phenomenal. And, and this is one of the things that makes them such a magnificent beast. <laughs> so scorpion fish, we have these, these are a worldwide subject. Uh, they're almost in all waters except for, I believe, the polar regions. So this is just one example of the scorpion fish larvae. There's many, many different kinds that I've photographed. Um, but this, I believe, is uh, either a raggy scorpion fish or I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, once they settle, though, they are highly adaptive. So once they get down to the substrate, these funny things begin to happen to these, these guys. They get these beautiful appendages, uh, the siri over the eyes. You know, one of the things that fish of this kind of, uh, with this extreme uh, morphine is um, that, you know, they do anything they can not to look like a fish. So I know as a person that guides people that shape recognition is everything. So, you know, it's, it's oftentimes I just see a shape of something and I know what it is right away and it draws my attention to it. So, you know, if, if, they, if I can see that, then you know what other fish are looking for when they're hunting. So, you know, anything that they can do to disguise themselves not to look like a fish is gonna work in their benefit. So here's a couple of Ambon scorpion fish, um, again, living on the substrate their whole life cycle after they settle. So they have to mate, feed, avoid being eaten by other subjects. And, you know, this happens 24 hours a day, every single minute. So they really have to, you know, be sharp at what they're doing. Some of them appear to have even been rolled in sand. So this one is a, a, black, a black one with just sand covering it entirely. Again, these guys will just sit, wait. Oftentimes these scorpion fish will rock back and forth like a piece of, um, you know, a, a leaf or something on the bottom or, or like an injured fish. And that action in itself will draw a subject to them. And then of course, they're a, a gape strike feeder, just like those other frogfish are. And um, they will snatch up the prey with, without hesitation. So here we can see a dragon net in the mouth of this ambon. The scorpion fish, another beautiful subject. See, there's actually three there. There's one on the bottom left. It's a female in the middle. The males will oftentimes book in the females. We see this frequently, all different kinds of fish in the bottom. The two males will be trying to, you know, mate with the females, so they'll, they'll book in. They also have a gape strike. Rhinopius, which is really one of the masters uh, of the macro world, are true masters of the domain. So these guys, they look gaudy, um, they look goofy. But again, if you think about that strategy of doing anything they can not to look like a fish, uh, it really works well for them. Here's a, a very good example of that. So this is a very garish looking kind of gaudy fish. But, you know, the reality of this was if you see that the, the algae that it's living in there, I was on one side of this little patch of algae. My guide was on the other. And we were actually looking for a crab that was living in that algae. We did not see this rhinopius. And both of us were, you know, maybe three feet maximum apart from each other with this between us. Okay, so we're looking and all of a sudden this guy flopped out of the algae. <laughs> it was just truly amazing. But that's how, um, how well that this disguise actually works. Here's a, a beautiful golden yellow one. I'm using a purple uh, light to kind of backlight uh, the subject so I can get a kind of a, a nice contrast on it. And then again, they also have this huge bucket mouth. They're able to consume fish larger than themselves, which, you know, it's pretty remarkable, really, to see them just suck in a huge fish, keep them inside, and then just grind them down and, you know, it's amazing. You know, there's that saying, big fish eats little fish, but I don't think these guys have heard that yet. <laughs> Stargazer, another really fascinating creature. They're an ambush predator also, but they burrow under the sand. So here's the larval stage and then the adult stage. Now, as a photographer, I also have ideas. Uh, I think about how to capture a photo and uh, like conceptualize different images. So with this one, I used a little bit of sand. I sprinkled it over the top and tried to make it look like stars. So the star, stargazer looking at stars. In the open ocean, we actually have nudibranchs. So um, nudibranchs are another 
very diverse group of subjects. And we'll talk about some of them now, but th this is one of the, the two, I believe, described nudibranchs that are in the uh, pelagic world. This one will never settle. In California, we have the uh, Hopkins rose. It's been re-described, um, rosacea, Okinia rosacea, I believe they call it now. Uh, very beautiful, but they mimic tough corals. Nudera alani mimics soft coral. See it on eggs here. Not sure what the Melody Colmeni actually mimics. We like to say it. it's mimicking a ball of twine. I've actually seen white algae like this, but if you look closely, you'll see the rhinophores on the left side, and those white lines are actually the muscles of this nudibranch that we're looking at here. Um, it really just looks like somebody watered up twine and threw it on the reef. California, we have very beautiful nudibranchs. Um, this is an alid. And how these guys uh, defend themselves is they eat different algae and uh, hydroids, and then they commute the, the uh, nematocysts from those hydroids, and they store them in their serrata, the red fuzzy things on its back. They store them there. And if a fish would come by and grab that nudibranch, those nematocysts would, would fire involuntarily and then sting the interior of the mouth of the fish. Some say that it would actually cause that fish to drown in its own saliva from being burned. So that's, that's just some awesome scientific, uh, you know, science meets art, <laughs> so to speak. Here's a, a really good example again of, of science meeting nature because uh, this nudibranch actually is uh, farming the algae that it consumes and using it to photosynthesize with the sun. So we have Phyllodesmia rudmani, and um, you can see the brown patches in there. That's that's actually algae zooxanthella that it consumes off the off the corals. Here it is on its host. Remarkably difficult to see, um, you know, if if you don't have the trained eye. In fact, I shot some photos. The other day for this presentation and it just did not work because I, I couldn't really show the difference between the two. So here's a pretty good example of the Rubani. This is the Melaby. So uh, we have a Melaby really perfectly matching its host. So we have the, the slug as you can see the arrows and then the host. Both of them, the uh, slug here is just uh, very small, maybe the size of my thumbnail and then the, uh, the algae that it's living on is a larger patch and just uh, really remarkable how closely these guys can match their host. So here's another good example of, of uh, strategy for survival. So, you know, batfish, other fish, you know, you live through this larval stage, you get strong enough to settle to the sand, the struggle still continues. So. The batfish, that orange band, mimics a uh, poisonous flatworm, as you can see on the right. Cardinal fish, as larvae, have giant wings. Cardinal fish in the substrate brood the eggs in the mouth. So as a photographer, this is one of the things I like to show people and take them and they can capture photos of different kinds of cardinal fish with different colorations of eggs. So, here you can see the eyes have really developed in these eggs and they're ready to hatch. Once they do, they'll go back out into the plankton to develop and um, you know that whole chain will start over again. Here's another type of cardinal fish. This one is shot in Indonesia, bad guy cardinal fish. The brooding continues after the hatch. So if you look into the mouth of these guys, you can actually see the fry. So um, it's really a remarkable thing to see. Now the eggs, get really beautiful red, ruby red and golden. And then once they hatch, the fry actually stays in the mouth. Jawfish also brood their eggs in their mouths. So this, this guy lives in a hole. And um, as it comes time for these eggs to hatch, he will really just sit right up at the top and aerate those eggs continuously until they hatch. The cephalopods are really some of the most fascinating creatures. So again, moving down uh, that slope like we are talking about in the beginning, kind of out into the water column. Uh, so cephalopods, truly aliens of the deep. 
Octopus have eight arms, three hearts, cyanoglobin blood. So unlike humans that have hemoglobin, they have iron-based blood, they have copper-based blood. Uh, they can change colors using the chromatophores. They can change textures, and they do all these things to communicate. This is a pajama squid from South Australia. Beautiful subject. These guys are really, really cute. They can get uh, quite large, actually, um, and just get this really cool coloration. And as you can see, those stripes, the little eyebrows, it gives them their nickname, the pajama squid. Flamboyant squid is something that we have a lot of here in the Philippines and the Indo Pacific. Um, rumored to have TTX on the tissue, so we encourage people not to lick those. It's a joke. We, we really encourage people never to touch the animals, but you definitely don't want to get TTX under your skin. This one's actually feeding. And in this image, um, we see the mating cycle happening. So right corner top, we have the female. Bottom corner left, we have a male. And in the middle, we have a male. So what happens is the smallest male will try to mate with that female. And you see this quite often. And the, the larger male there in the middle will block the smaller one. And he puts so much energy into blocking that smaller one that uh, that female just kind of like, you know, come on guys, figure it out. I'm waiting for you. So what happens is the smaller male actually mimics a female. The dominant male will drop his guard and then the smallest sneaker male will get in there and mate with the female. So you can see him mating with the female there. It might be hard to see in the image, but you can actually see the sneaker male right there mating with the female. Here they are hatching from the eggs, or he is or she, single, actually hatching from the egg. Wonderpus, normal wonderpus here in the, in the uh, water column. So just has some, some pigment to it. You can see the color flakes in there. Hasn't quite developed all the coloration and pigment that it needs yet. It's not quite strong enough to settle to the sand. But when they do, they don't look anything like themselves uh, prior to this to settling. So here's an adult wonderpus, beautiful barring. And here's another one here feeding. You can see the eye of a small fish that it's webbed over. So a lot of these uh, different octopus use this strategy of webbing over things. They'll trap it and then beat down and kill them. And um, the way they do this is very interesting. They, they actually beak right into the heart of their subject. So, you know, if there was a, actually a, a humane subject of the way, the way they kill other things, um, the octopus would have to be the most humane in the way it kills other subjects to consume them. Mimic octopus larvae. These guys look exactly like and behave exactly like the adults do on the sand. So this one's actually, um, you can see it, it has a wonder, uh, not a wonder, I'm sorry. The mimic is actually attacking a, a um, mantis shrimp. So it's got that mantis shrimp, it's playing cat and mouse. It tires out that mantis and then finally beats down on it. Blue ring octopus larvae. You know, in the water column, these guys are very small and uh, they still have not settled to the sand yet, but they have those blue rings on them. So when you're out there drifting around in the ocean at nighttime and you see these, you know, you say, oh, it's just an octopus. Wow, it's got blue rings on it. You know, it's incredible. Again, a blue ring octopus actually has the TTX. So TTX is an extremely powerful neurotoxin. And if you were to be um, beaked or bitten by a blue ring, uh, it would it would absolutely kill you dead. There's they have enough ven venom in one bite to uh, to kill up to 25 people. So the the poison that they carry is actually not created from venom glands like like a rattlesnake has venom glands uh, and they use that to envenomate the subjects. These guys that that poison is actually created as a byproduct of the digestive process. So interesting little tidbit. Here are uh, a male and female mating. So we have the male on the top, female on the bottom. Female of almost every single species is more robust and um, able to, to carry the bloodline. The, uh, the male after this will, will die. And then the female will carry the eggs, not eating, of course, until they hatch. One of my absolute favorites, like I said in the beginning, I'd say that word a lot. Um, has to be squids. They really are 
just an amazing subject. And if I was if I was to take a, a terrestrial subject, land-based subject, and compare those to squids, it would have to be wolves, okay? Because squid hunts in wolf packs, and um, they move very quickly. They're able to use their talon-like uh, beaks that are on their on their tentacles to, to grab subjects like the teeth of a dog, like the teeth of those wolves, and then consume their prey. So very cunning, very fast, and uh, and smart, very smart. So squids have eight arms and two elastic style tentacles. So a little bit different than an octopus in that way. And um, these guys will never settle to the sand. So they're always living in an open ocean. Here's a good example of one that's snatched a fish and just consuming it. Here's an anope squid, just a fascinating subject. There is, I think, 350 or more varieties of squids. Most of them live very deep and they, they follow the planktons up at night to feed and then return, uh, you know, as the sun rises, they go back to the safety of the depths. Diamond squids, these can get up to 70 pounds or more. And uh, very beautiful. You can see the diamond squid, the smaller one here on the bottom. They just light up at night. They're really beautiful. They have a lot of different colorations to them. And uh, just, you know, visually a stunning animal. A school of jellyfish is referred to as a smack, a smack of jellies. So this is actually shot in Monterey uh, last year, the year before, from the surface while we're getting onto the boat. But in the ocean, this is what they look like. So I, I really love jellyfish as well. And there's some really great books out there uh, that provide great reading on these subjects. Some of the oldest organisms on the planet, rumored to be over 50 million years old. And they know that from some of the fossilized finds. Very hard subject to find fossils of because, you know, they're just like uh, nothing more than really organized water. So when they decompose, there's not much left to see. Uh, they're gelatinous, they have this incredible ability to regenerate themselves and reanimate. In fact, the ones on the left, the immortal jellyfish, can live forever, regenerating themselves and reverting back to the polyp. And then from there, growing back up through the sexual maturity stage and then back to the polyp. Uh, on the right, we see this just enormous cloud of the um, of, of jellyfish moving through the water column. This is, this is in Monterey and uh, sea nettles, you can see nettles there, very beautiful. This is from here in our, in our bay. So jellyfish are brainless and heartless, but that doesn't make them, uh, you know, a worthless kind of critter. Now, most people think of jellyfish and relate to them because, you know, they have a potential of stinging you, but that's not the only thing about them. You know, they, they provide a food source. Uh, they can be a predator. They can be uh, the prey. They can change that role uh, at different times. And you know, just a, an amazing subject, really. Uh, this, this photo shows a filefish that's mouth anchored onto the jellyfish. Um, they, they mouth anchor onto things. Different types of filefish will mouth anchor onto on algae. These ones will mouth anchor and sleep on jellyfish and then consume the jellyfish over a period of time. Jackfish actually select the jellies and, um, at a very young age and use them as a, in a mutual relationship. So the mutualism begins very early. The jack stays with that jelly for an unknown, unknown length of time, really, and that uh, each organism benefits from that relationship. At times, some of these smaller fish will actually uh, swim amongst the tentacles, okay, and it lures other fish in. And when the other fish comes in, they're stung by the soup by the jellyfish, and then that that uh, partner fish actually eats the scraps. So it's a very mutual, beneficial relationship. The ribbon fish mimics jellyfish for survival, and of course, one of the craziest subjects out there has to be the blanket octopus. Now, blanket octopus is um, you know one of those things of fables, and the reason why I put that slide up in the beginning. About the sea monsters is if there's probably any kind of a sea monster out there or was um, it would either have to be a giant squid or blanket octopus and these can grow to, to uh, about six feet 
So it can get quite large. And then when that blanket opens, it's just an amazing subject to see. So um, again, I really encourage you to Google this guy and you can get some nice background on that. Really fascinating read, but I have a, a quick video here. Wow, you know, talk about the ultimate uh, photo op and seeing a subject like that in open ocean is, is truly magnificent. And um, so this, this brings me to the end. You know, this has really been uh, kind of a quick talk. I, I uh, wanted to just describe to, to you guys what some of these magnificent beasts that exist out there in the ocean and, and try to expose some of them and their behaviors and relationships uh, to each other and uh, string it together in a, in a way that kind of made sense. So I hope that you enjoyed the show. Thank you. Mike, thank you. Thank you for these remarkable photographs that show the beauty, the diversity, and the remarkable adaptation strategy of these animals to, to thrive in every niche of the, the world ocean. You know, the, yes. All photographers, when they see photographs like this and see what re remarkable photographs you've taken over many years, they oft often say, if I only knew the kind of equipment he was using, I could, <laughs> I could do that too. Now, it's not true, yeah, but yeah, tell, tell us, what, what kind of equipment do you use? So for my camera gear, I, I use, I shoot Nikon. I shoot Nikon cameras. Um, I have a D500 and a D850. Uh, one is full frame, one is crop sensor. And um, I put those in the CNC housing. And I use uh, lights, the strobes, the strobe lights, the flash, uh, to, to add the color back to, to the subjects and um, in a variety of different lenses. So for instance, on uh, you know the substrate like this, I might use a 60 millimeter or a 105 millimeter lens, where on a reef, I might use a 15 millimeter. Right. So, just depends what I'm going after, and and yeah, so that's that's basically what I use. So and patience, creativity, and and as you say, some of these shots they may take only a fraction of a second, but they take days, weeks, um, months to find the the right subject in the right place. And I yes, I admire yes, you. definitely. It so, takes time. But. So so Mike, when you started your career. Was that uh -huh. it in the digital camera age, or did you actually start with film? I had a film camera in the beginning, but I, I had never been published with it. In fact, um, my photos were, I was a master of shooting fish butts <laughs> with that little film camera. <laughs> Sorry, but, uh, you know, um, I was fortunate enough to come into underwater photography just as film was fading out and digital was beginning. I was, I was uh, at that moment in time where I thought, should I buy that film camera, which was the RS system, or should I buy, you know, this uh, Nikon D70 system? So what I actually did was uh, I said, I'll buy the film system, but I'll, I'll just put it off because, you know, digital is just a fad. It's never going to be around. It's, I mean, it's just going <laughs> to, <laughs> right? So I bought a little compact camera. I used that one time and thought, this is really incredible because I can see it's instant feedback. So, of course, we know where digital went. Yes, and we, we also know that uh, when we, at the start of all of this, Kodak and Polaroid thought digital was just a fad. And they, they uh, even sure. though they had developed early cameras, they missed yeah. that opportunity and, and been trying yeah, to catch sure up. Did. So you've been at this for quite a while all over the world. Uh -huh. Have you seen any trends and changes in the ocean that you find startling? Um, I have. And, you know, it's, it's sad. Mostly what I've seen is the, the amount of pollution um, in, in the ocean. So a lot of plastic, different times of the year, we'll see the currents change and bring plastics in. 
Uh, and and that's that's just terrible. It, it really, the, I've seen a lot of different fish that are attracted to it. And, you know, it's just something that's, that we need to really pay attention to. Uh, another thing that I've, I've been disturbed by is um, runoff from uh, waste, waste runoff causing problems and damages to, uh, to reef systems and things of that nature. So yeah, over a period of time and, and also a decrease of, of fish, you know, I've seen a decrease of, of fish in the food chain that, that make a difference. So, um, you know, yeah, I know that MPAs work. I knew, I know they do. If there was more protections that were, you know, put into place, I think that they would provide, um, a better means for, for fish to regenerate and rejuvenate and hopefully move the oceans back towards being healthier. And right, right now, the exhibit that we're featuring uh, deals with the world's coral reefs, nature's underwater cities. Uh, you, you've done a lot of diving on coral reefs. Have, have you seen the effects of climate change and, and warming and bleaching on coral reefs? We do in certain areas of the Philippines uh, see that. Now, I know that different corals for some reason can tolerate warmer water while others cannot tolerate the, any fluctuations. I was in Papua New Guinea in uh, twice last, towards the last um, part of uh, 2019. And the water there was almost 90 degrees and the corals were thriving, okay? Now back in the Philippines, we saw the, the water temperatures go, the average about 83, 84, move up to some of the warmest they've ever been this year, which we're only talking maybe one and a half degrees difference and immediately the coral bleaching. So while some of the areas this, the warming can be tolerated, there's other areas that absolutely cannot. And, you know, fortunately for Anilau, we have quick access to deep water. So there's cool currents that rejuvenate those, uh, bleached corals, but other places it's being devastated. And, and the, this mystery of why some of these corals are so much more thermally tolerant is one that we explore in our exhibit. And, and it, it really is curious because as, as you say, uh, you, some, in some areas, corals will bleach at a lower temperature than corals in other areas that experience higher temperatures. And the, what happened with the Great Barrier Reef is a good example. Yeah. That's a very good example, very good example. Well, Mike, thank you. As, as always, it's a real pleasure to have you share your images with us, and, and we thank you, and we hope that you'll be back many, many times. Uh, thank you, Jerry, it's been a pleasure. The, uh, I retire next week, and yes. uh, so it, it has been a pleasure spending time with all of you out there with these lectures over the last 18 years. And even though I go, the lecture series will continue. We hope that you will join us on August the 11th when Jeffrey Bennett will talk about climate change, the causes, the consequences, and what we can do about, about climate change. And he'll be examining this from the perspective of what the science tells us. So I wish you all a good night and a goodbye. Thank you.